guys. So in the previous rant, I talked about what forgiveness is not. So today we're going to talk about what forgiveness actually is from a gospel perspective, from a, a biblical perspective, and then how it's actually applied. So um, let's talk about it. First and foremost, I said this before, I'll say it again. We should handle forgiveness in a way that reflects the gospel, okay, that reflects the gospel. And because of that, then we must understand how God um, handles forgiveness. We have to understand how God applies forgiveness, and from there we move forward. So the first thing we got to know is God has a condition for forgiveness. It's confession and repentance of sin, evidenced by a changed heart and a changed lifestyle, right? So someone who, the Bible says, you cannot say you're a Christian and you're forgiven of your sins and you're born again if you continue on sinning as if it was normal. Um, and so uh, we need to make sure that if someone says they are sorry, there's number one, confession of sin. Number two, there is a change of heart. And number three, we see the fruits and we see restitution being made. We see uh, repentance bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. So we got to take a look at all those things. What we have to do in our, in our own personal selves is to be ready to forgive. <clears throat> so there's a difference between the actual forgiveness taking place and the attitude, <clears throat> the attitude of being ready to forgive. Those are two separate things. Just like um, I have a ball pen here, there's a difference between me being willing to lend you this pen versus you actually saying, can I borrow the pen and I lend it to you, right? So there's a difference there. You don't just assume that just because I'm willing to lend the pen, it doesn't mean the pen has already been lent, okay? So in the same sense, forgiveness, the attitude of being ready to forgive is different from the actual transaction of forgiveness. Those are two separate things. All right. If we are ready and willing to extend forgiveness, to give forgiveness, if the person, of course, comes to us, confesses their sin, repents, shows restitution, bears fruit, blah, 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 all of that stuff, then we should forgive. We should forgive. What God calls every Christian to do is to have an attitude that is ready to forgive. Not to immediately forgive, but to have an attitude that is ready to forgive. That's the call of God in all our lives as Christians. Now, the problem when we conflate the attitude versus and the transaction, we put them together, we merge them, that's wrong. That's biblically uh, wrong. It's not biblical. Because when we merge the two, um, it's confusing. It's like, you want to borrow the pen? Yes, but you, I, already, I already lent it to you. Like, not yet. You haven't given me the pen. You know, it's confusing. It's just confusing. And it's the same thing with forgiveness, okay? Biblically, forgiveness is not just something that is offered, but there is also an actual transaction. And so, the offer and the transaction are two different things, right? And we should actually, the Bible actually tells us or teaches us by, by example to withhold forgiveness until it is asked and there is confession and then we give. How do we know this? How do we know this? Let's take a look. The parable of the unforgiving servant, you know, Peter said, how many times should I forgive my brother? And then Jesus says, not just 70 times 7, seven uh, not just 7 times, but 70 times 7. So if you calculate that, that's 4,900, 490. I don't, I, I'm not very good with math, but you know, a lot. So the principle there is you have to keep forgiving, 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 and forgiving. Why? We sin against God all the time, all the time, all the time. We sin repeatedly. Many times it's even the same sin, but God forgives us. And therefore, if a person comes to us and genuinely repents, we forgive. They sin again and genuinely repent, we forgive. They come again, they genuinely repent, we forgive. And we help them with their struggle. Uh, the same thing you can see with kids, right? They sin, they make a mess. Sorry, dad. Sorry, dad. Sorry, mom. We forgive them. Same story. They repeat it again. We forgive again. Same with spouses, same with friendships, as long as the repentance is genuine, okay? Look for restitution, look for all of that. Notice the parable that uh, Jesus gives Peter after that. There was, I'm sure you guys know this parable, it's in Matthew. Uh, there was this guy, uh, there was a, a master, there was a servant, and then this dude, the servant, uh, owed the master a debt. And he begged, he begged the master, he said, please, please, be patient with me. And so the master forgave him his debt. And then he goes to another servant who owed him some uh, who, uh, who owed him a, a sum and he, he grabbed the guy and said pay me and then the guy said please forgive me my dad forgive me be patient and the guy said no I'm not going to forgive you and threw the guy in prison um, notice 
there was a begging. There was someone who said, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. There was, there was a, a gesture of repentance there, of, of asking for forgiveness. So forgiveness was not just given uh, en masse. There was someone who asked for forgiveness. Think of Peter's denial three times. Jesus did not say, hey, Peter, how are you? And then, you know, just ignored it, swept it under the rug. Peter didn't even bring it up. Peter was quiet about the denial. It was Jesus who took him aside and said, Peter, do you love me more than these? What was Jesus doing? He was confronting. He was getting a confession first. Peter, do you love me more than these? Lord, you know I do. Peter, do you love me more than these? You know I do. Do you love me more than these? And Peter just cries, man. He just breaks down. He's like, Lord, you know I do. And and, and so forgiveness took place when Peter confessed three times and genuinely repented three times. So we see God wanting the confession to come out. Imagine now church discipline that bypasses confection, uh, confession. You know, someone sins, we don't see if he's repentant or not, and we just go, hey church, as a church, we are supposed to be Christ-like and so we're supposed to forgive, right? So whether or not he's repented or confessed, doesn't matter. We just totally forgive, ba-bam, and then he's back into the fold like nothing happened. No. What does uh, the Bible teach about church discipline? It's actually for their good. It's for the good of the sinner to to experience some of the consequences of the sin so they know it's actually sin. They experience the grief, the pain, they mourn for the sin, they confess their sin, they genuinely repent, and then they are restored. Restoration comes after repentance, right? After repentance. It doesn't come before so if you think about it, if forgiveness, so let's go to the counseling side. If forgiveness is given prematurely uh, without the confession, repentance, or restitution, then um, it's the sin is not really dealt with openly by either party. Uh, if it is in a church setting, it's not dealt openly and people will think it's okay to sin. Anyway, I'm just going to get forgiven. It's not even going to be addressed. There's no shame involved. There's no pain involved. You know, sin is actually great. It's pleasurable. And that's wrong, right? So we have to... We have to apply gospel truths in the way we handle forgiveness. All right now, in the long run, it doesn't help the offender. It doesn't help the offended. It doesn't help anyone. It it ruins the gospel, the reputation of the gospel. Forcing people to forgive the unrepentant is also a false burden on the offended party. It causes what we call biblical cognitive dissonance on the part of the offended party because they're going to think I'm supposed to forgive but they have not repented in fact they're continuing to attack me you know maybe lie about me gossip about me slander me steal from me abuse me you know talk against me talk to me in a really rude way whatever it is um, we, we don't just say forgive you should forgive the burden should be on the offender to try to restore the relationship and what we should tell the offended party is, you know, don't don't force them to forgive. It's just going to breed frustration, self-disappointment, self-condemnation for being unforgiving, quote-unquote unforgiving, when actually it's actually just right to, for, to withhold forgiveness until confession and repentance and restitution and all of that takes place. Um, and it makes God seem unreasonable because it seems like God is telling us to do something that even God himself is not doing. Can you imagine God saying, you should forgive without them repenting? And then you say, God, have you done that for people? Do you forgive people who don't repent? God says, no, but you should be more forgiving than me. That's wrong. Let's not hold people to a standard that not even God himself holds himself to. Right? God, It's possible for God to show love without forgiving. You know what that's called? Common grace. God shows love towards his enemies via common grace while not being uh, while these people are not forgiven yet God still shows love right so showing love to the unrepentant may even include um, avoiding them the Bible talks about that as well that you have to actually avoid uh, certain people but we must have an attitude that is ready to forgive until then what we tell people is to overlook the offense to focus on the Lord to focus on God's call in their lives and to continue serving Him while asking God for the grace to continue to overlook, to not mind, to not focus on, to not meditate on the sin, but to meditate on the cross. That's really it. I hope this helped. God bless you.